it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 94 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget, we brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? This is Ethiopian. Yes, it is. It's very strong. It's strong. It's very good. (laughs) I really like it. Are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a long-time subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus all products ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. Okay, so we're sitting around the table. We're drinking our coffee. It was a very rainy day. Mm -hmm. First day of school for my girls. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pouring down rain. So how are you doing? Pretty well. Hanging in there? Yeah, yeah. That was a lot of rain last night. We needed it. We haven't had rain in forever. I think the one day I took Sophia to Salisbury U to check it out and Joseph was like a monsoon. Mm-hmm. That was like three weeks ago. Something yeah, yeah. Like that. that was the last rain we had yeah. here. I've been watering the garden a lot, which is always, the, you know, the indicator that we need more. But, you know, the pastures needed, et cetera. We didn't really need three inches no. overnight, but it is what it is. I was on the phone with you. I walk out. And I'm like, well, the water bowls are already full. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> dump all those and refill. Oh, but that's the worst thing about a bad storm is I have to spend all this time cleaning the food bowls and the water bowls and everything else because just the dirt splatters everywhere. Yeah. The trials of a chicken keeper. I was all upset this morning too when I woke up at like 5 a.m. because the kids were school and mm. the, here the pouring down rain because normally I get really pretty pictures of them on the first day oh, right. outside. Mm-hmm. That didn't Not happen. today. And today was Sophia's last first day. Oh no. I think that'd be happy. I'm happy and but she's my baby. She's not allowed to get big. You're going to have a hard time stopping that. Just, <laughs> I'm just know, saying. I know. I know. I just returned back this weekend from Charleston, had a great time. The girls did a wonderful job. Thank you, girls, for taking care of the chickens Mm -hmm, while I was away. mm -hmm. They were funny. Sophia kept saying to me, Gertie's laying in the coop back there now. Oh, is she? She is. Okay. And Sophia said it to me the other day. She goes, she is the queen of that little tribe. She is just rolling. I mean, she is loving it. But I still think she's always going to be a little bored. Probably. She's always going to want some outside time, some Gertie, queen, free range by herself time. But she's doing better than I expected. Now, Good. today was the first day that I took the one panel of the fence and folded it down to mm-hmm. make it a little easier to mix and mingle. Uh huh. So after we finish recording, I'm going to have to go back and double check. Okay. Make sure everybody is doing well out there. Yeah, our integration has gone pretty well. Surprise, surprise. So six new pullets in what we call the Brahma Yard. Yeah. And I would have thought that Pansy, the Swedish flower dictator, would be rough. Yeah. No. It's Eclair. Well, she's feeling good. Apparently. She had that little molt. I don't know if her whole molt is done. I think she's just molting very slowly. She's through the worst of it. Yeah, I think so. And she's feeling healthy. She had some issues in the spring. Yes. With the zinc. Well, I picked her up last night, and I will say that she has gained back all the weight that she lost. That's good. So she's feeling good. So she's like, okay, little youngins, I'm going to set the way. Yeah, but they're pretty smart. They run away from her. Last night, I saw the cutest thing. I saw June back on the other side, where she's not supposed to be, Mm -hmm. with Gertie. And keep in mind, those are the only two left. Of that particular group, right? Yeah. And she was cleaning her beak. (laughs) I thought I'd never see that again. That's pretty cute. Yeah, it was so cute. Well, it just goes to show you that with a little bit of patience and time, things work out. You have to be work flexible out. and you have yeah. to have some systems in place, but yeah. it can work out. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it works out much better than you would ever have patience. guessed. Mm-hmm. I think patience is the number one thing. No, I will say getting my Andalusians into the Jersey Giant flock. <laughs> Catalina a couple times has gotten into the general population and the two who are really going after her are Franny, the Krusty Cream Leg Bar, and Mary Berry, the Speckled Sussex. So they're the lowest. Along yeah. with Croissant, the Favreals, but she doesn't bother anybody. Yeah. 
Yes, so we'll see how that goes. They need to get a little bigger. Trials and tribulations of our integration will keep you posted how it's going. (laughs) So I just want to take a second to ask everybody a huge favor. If you're listening to the show and you're loving it, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. While you're there, hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. It's another thing that helps us grow so much. You can also share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell a chicken-loving friend about the podcast. If you're looking for other ways to support us, you can check out our Etsy shop. Soon to be mugs over there. Mm-hmm. We keep saying that. I know. We can't wait. You can visit us on Patreon, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Check out our levels of membership. The other thing you can do to help support the podcast, visit our show notes, use our affiliate links and our discount codes and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chicken? Of course. Then Yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the August Box, I absolutely love the chicken pot holders and the Ikea scrub brush. My chickens are going crazy over those grubbly grubs in that box. And the chicken note cards are going to be great to send into school with the teachers. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order, and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog, and don't forget, pre-orders start November 2022 for the spring 2023 season. Dun, 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 dun. It's a time for Breed Spotlight, yes! <laughs> a little Russian. <laughs> well. Everybody knows I like to have fun with this. It's just my little quirky thing. This week's Breed Spotlight is... The Russian Orlov. <laughs> and it's a cutie. It is a cute chicken, actually. The Russian Orlov is a super... Cold hardy chicken that developed in Russia. But Russia. I wouldn't think anything else. It's from Russia. It has to be cold hardy. Yeah, you would hope so, right? Yeah. So they may have come from foundation stock that were known as the Persian Gillen chickens and date back to around the 1600s. Persia is modern day Iran. Yeah. So the story goes that back in the 1700s, the Gillens were imported into Russia by Count Alexei Orlov Tekamensky. Very Russian name. Very Russian name. Count Alexei was a breed enthusiast. He also bred horses, and he ended up being really interested in these chickens. So he worked to promote this breed and to increase the cold hardiness by crossing it with several European breeds. Okay, so what are these European breeds? So according to the Livestock Conservancy, they may have included the Yushanki, the Malay, the Bruges Fighter, the Belgian Gameberg, a bearded European Spangled breed, and Thuringian birds. Mostly breeds that we've never heard of. Yeah, I'd say so. Mm-hmm. The Malay strikes me as the one that I know of. But the Malay is a foundation breed for so many different birds. Absolutely. That, that doesn't surprise me one bit. Well, I got to tell you, we're going to get into this a little later, but I feel like the Malay was already there. And you'll see what I mean. The as Malay get- is like probably with the cave people. <laughs> uh, man, maybe it was. <laughs> like the first dinosaur that went to be a chicken uh-huh. was a Malay. It was a Malay. Records indicate that the SEL is like 3,500 years old. Yeah. I would think that the melee is probably close to that. Me too. I mean, honestly, I think all these birds may have a touch of melee. Probably. Yeah. I mean, that's why when we talk about melee being unthreatened, 
it's so important that this bird isn't because Absolutely. it's such a foundation breed for all the other birds. It really is. So yeah, I know we're off on a little tangent, but the melee but, is obviously in most every single bird. Mm-hmm. So Count Alexi worked with all these breeds. Eventually, this bird was named for him. I don't know if that was during his lifetime or not. Right. It's hard to tell. Back to the Gillens. There are a lot of visual similarities between the Orloff and the Gillen, and a lot of what appears to be melee visible to me in both of them. Well, the Gillen, I can see the body shape of this chicken having mm-hmm. the same, and the melee, I see the long neck. Right. I mean, it comes out in different ways. The melee is known for an extremely long neck. Right, long chicken. legs, long neck, right. So the way the back of this chicken slopes mm-hmm. looks like the Gillen. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to say this. Reminds me of an Americana. No, I had the same thought. I looked at them and thought, They're adorable. The hens especially, they look a lot like Americanas. They do. I thought that too. So they're currently found in the threatened category of the Livestock Conservancy's conservation priority list. Not surprised. No, not at all. So if you've never seen the Russian Orlov, look it up. They're tall, gamey looking chickens with a lot of that gaminess disguised by the heavy feathering. They have a lot of heavy feathering. Now, here's the part that you can understand. They're Russian. They were in the cold. So they're going to need heavy feathering. They also remind me a little of the Salmon Favarals. They're kind of a little bit like overfluffed, made for cold weather. They kind of are similar to well, those. Hold on to that thought for a little while. So like you mentioned, they are heavily muffed and bearded, but their head kind of still has that gamey or actually melee shape to it. Because they have a small walnut comb. Mm-hmm. So their comb and the way that their head is shaped does look melee and it looks like they have an extremely long neck right so the orloffs have what is known various people describe it different ways sometimes you see walnut sometimes you see cushion sometimes you see strawberry comb and the melee also is described as the strawberry comb and they have very little waddles as you would expect yeah they're cold hardy right they have yellow legs with no feathers they have clean legs they have intense golden orange eyes, and their face itself is heavily feathered as well. Yeah, any bird that's cold hardy, these are the characteristics right. of them. Now, in the U.S., most of the Orloffs are the beautiful spangled variety. Right. And there are some of the mahogany stock as well, also very pretty red birds. So the spangled looks like the coloring of a speckled Sussex. Some of them do, yeah. These chickens are reminding me of like five different chickens. Well, the thing is, there's not, and we'll talk about this more in a bit, there's no real breed standard for them at this point. So you do get a lot of variety. The mahogany stock is also really beautiful. They're also found as bantams. There are not many of them, and they're mostly show birds. Mm -hmm. The standard size Orloffs are big chickens. Eight to nine for the roos Mm -hmm. and about six and a half for the females. That's a little bit of a difference where you don't see that much of a difference so much. Right. The boys are a lot bigger than the girls. Sometimes if you have an eight to nine pound roo, you're going to have like at least a seven and a half to eight pound hen. Often, yeah. The fact that these are averaging around six and a half pound hens, to me, there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, here's where this gets really complicated. The Orloff is not found in the modern or the most recent American Poultry Association standard of perfection. There are some sources that document their presence in the U.S. in the late 18 and early 1900s, like eyewitness accounts, writings. They allegedly appeared in the standard of perfection in 1875, but were dropped in 1894 due to the lack of popularity. Now, your best friend happens to be a total chicken geek. Really? And I have (laughs) on my bookshelf the 1891 Standard of Perfection. So I looked and I did find a breed called Russians listed in the miscellaneous category along with Sultans and Silkies. I'm sure that's them. I thought they'd be the same breed, right? But the Russian Orlov Society of the U.S. and Canada says that these birds, these Russians, are a separate breed known as the Russian Black or Russian Black Bearded. You know what? I think this bird had some transitions over the years. Probably. Maybe started off as all black. So I'll tell you some of the details I found. I did research the black Russians and they are very similar to the Orloff. One of the possible differences was leg color. Mm-hmm. Orloffs have the yellow legs and I saw some slate color in the blacks. Their comb is the other thing. The Orloffs have the cushion or the strawberry or the walnut comb, while the Russian blacks were listed as having a rose comb without the spike. I can see the rose comb transforming into one of these combs. The Livestock Conservancy notes that a rose comb without the spike is consistent with a strawberry or a cushion comb. They do believe that the early Russian chickens mentioned in the 18th and 19th century writings are the Orloff, and the British Poultry Club recognizes the black color as a variety of Orloff. I think it's the same chicken that had some mutations over the years. It's very likely. I mean, you bring in extra chickens, you bring in extra varieties, right. and you're going to have all these different colors. And I'm not sure if there was ever a standard of perfection for them in Russia. 
The Russian Orlov Society of the U.S. and Canada actually had a video from a chicken show in Russia that was in some modern period, not that yeah. long ago, where they had the Russian blacks. Okay. They were very, very similar to the Orlovs. So I think if they're not the same they're breed, cousins. they're somehow related. What they reminded me of, to be perfectly honest, was like a rose comb leghorn and a straight comb leghorn. Yeah. That's what I saw when I looked at them. I kind of so. feel like this bird somehow, they're kind of maybe one or the same or come from very similar stock. Mm-hmm. And over the years, different birds were introduced, different varieties happened. Right. And there's no standard of perfection. Not the one that we know of or that we right. read because neither one of us reads Cyrillic. I'm going to say they're cute. They're different. They're very cute. And it could be worth adding to your flock. I like them. I thought that they were really neat birds. Now, we checked in with your favorite poultry historian. Oh, God. Lewis Wright. Here we go. Well, he, what did Lewis have to say? He went to the poultry exhibition in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1899. Of course he did. He did. And he saw the Russian fowl in, for, in person there for the first time. Was this man in every chicken category? I think this is what happens when you have a wealthy person who has time and money and is obsessed with chickens. He was like your crazy chicken man. He was. <laughs> He absolutely was, yeah. And thank goodness for him because he wrote a lot of stuff. I mean, he did. So he was informed while he was at the show that the Orlov was the best breed of all the Russian chickens. He noted that some sources at the time suggested that the Orlov was a cross between the Malay and the Salmon Favreau. This is how I'm secretly, I know my stuff, <laughs> but yet I don't know that. It was you know disproved, I mean? though. It was Come disproved. Come on. I could see a Salmon Favreau in this chicken, along Lewis. with an Americana, along with the Malay. Uh-huh. Lewis Wright thought that there was a similarity with the Indian game, what we call the Cornish. I suppose I can see some of that, but what I really see in this bird is the melee. Now, he did mention that as far as he could find, the breed was only found in three colors, white, mahogany, and speckled. And he also attempted to procure some for breeding, but did not have luck ultimately. So, Crazy chicken man. He tells us it was there. He tells us it was around. He seems to be indicating that the Russian black chickens or the Russian black bearded chickens were not shown as Orlovs, but we don't know whether they were at the show or not. It's pretty limited what he has to say about Come them. Come on, Lewis. You should have wrote this down. The Orlov is primarily a meat breed. We would call them dual purpose, but the hens are not known to be great layers. Let's see. They lay about 100 eggs or so per year. That's about two a week. So they're going to be a companion bird. I see no reason why you can't add them to your flock. I mean, if you already have 15 or more chickens, Mm -hmm. sometimes you get chickens because you like their personalities or you like the chicken because the egg at that point is not nearly as important as if you had four chickens for your family. You want them to be egg producing. Right, right. Now, we know they're extremely cold hardy and we know that they'll need some help dealing with summer heat. But if you know, if you're in the far north, this is not a bad chicken for you at all. They may not sound like an ideal bird for a backyard flock. They may not sound like an ideal companion chicken, except that they're known to have very nice personalities. Yeah. They're reputed to be very calm and smart and not aggressive, but they're not pushovers. They will stand up for themselves if they have to. Yeah, that's what I was saying before. I could see this chicken being a companion chicken for Mm -hmm. somebody. Yep. Chickens like this aren't a homestead bird for somebody who has four to 10 chickens and you want eggs. Right. But like I said, if you want chickens because you love the different breeds, Mm -hmm. you love getting different chickens and seeing them, and once you have 15 or more, the eggs aren't as important, you're getting eggs regularly, this chicken would be a good addition as a companion. They're known to work well in a mixed flock. And Jeanette Berenger mentioned this to us before when it comes to meat chickens. Obviously, we respect that path. It's not our path. But with a chicken like this, it's a slow-growing heritage breed. It often doesn't work for that purpose anyway. No. I mean, it's going to be a companion chicken. Right. You're going to look at this little bird, believe me, once you look her up or him, and you're going to look at the beard and muffs and they're pretty cute. cute. Yeah. And this is one that you're going to want to carry around in your yard Mm -hmm. and have fun with. And, you know, twice a week, have a nice little egg from them as a thank you for taking care of them. Well, my question is the bigger picture here. And that is, do these chickens have fewer reproductive problems because they don't lay as often? You know what? There is some good in that. Yeah. Because when you deal with chickens that have reproductive issues, it's not fun. No, it's awful. And you're constantly trying to figure out what's causing it and what's stopping it. You know, like I was thinking about this the other day with the babies not laying yet. And I was like, thank God, it's one less thing you have to worry about. Right. They're not there yet. Because when they start laying, then you're like, okay, are they laying? The egg's weird. You know, what's mm-hmm. going on? Right. So 
I agree with you. I think if they're only supposed to lay two eggs a week, they can still have problems, but maybe they're less because their systems aren't as stressed. That's what I'm hoping. So if there's anyone out there who keeps the Russian Orloff, could you let us know what their average lifespan is and whether or not they're pretty healthy in the reproductive department? We're just curious about this. So if you are interested in this breed, there is a Russian Orloff Society of the USA and Canada. They do keep a breeder's list for both standard size and bantams. The bantam would be so cute. Oh, those are ridiculous. I'm one person who loves bantams that doesn't have them. At one point, I do want to get them, but Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like these cute chickens that have the chipmunk faces. You just love to look at them. Adorable. This chicken has the markings of a speckled Sussex and a head of an Americana. Kind of a perfect chicken, isn't it? Yeah. You can check the Livestock Conservancy's Breeders Directory, see if you can find any Russian Orloff breeders on there. A few of the commercial hatcheries carry them. Or you can go to somebody that we know, and that is Greenfire Farms, Mm -hmm. who has a lot of rare breed chickens, and they do have them, but they They, sell straight run. And it's a mixed lot. So what you will get from Greenfire Farm is a straight run mixed lot of both the mahogany and the spangled Russian Orlovs. Now, I think they're both beautiful. Yeah. I love the spangled chickens because I'm crazy about spotted chickens. The mahogany is very pretty. It's a deep red with a tiny bit of partridge here and there. But I think what's important is they're cute and they have a nice personality because you want to be able to handle them and look at them and love them. Mm -hmm. And this is a chicken that could be for you. Give them a chance. They are on the threatened list. So it might be one that you can see in your flock. If you already have a good number of chickens that are good egg layers, maybe there's less reproductive issues if they're only laying twice a week. Right. This is complete fantasy land. If I walked into our local feed store and there were some Russian Orloff chicks for sale. I already know you're going to be all over them. Yeah. Box them up. They're going home with mama. (laughs) The breed spotlights that we do sometimes, we try to bring awareness to breeds that Mm -hmm. no one really knows about. Because they're out there also. Right. And the problem is that the chick industry that's in your farm supply store They are going to order the ones that are the most popular because they want to sell them. That's right. And they sell them wholeheartedly, all those really popular chickens. These chickens, you have to go to a hatchery and get them yourself or a breeder. But we don't want you to forget about them. So they are on the threatened list. They're not critically endangered. Right. That's probably because there is that active club in the U.S. and Canada. Right. So go give them a look. We have their website linked in the show notes. And if you have this chicken, send us a picture. We'll give you a story. We'd love to see the pictures of your birds. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Amazon.com or Nestera.us. Use our code CWTCLP10 for 10% off. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, take a look at Roosty's store on Amazon.com. We've personally tested their products and we're huge fans. They have their famous nesting pads, those fantastic chick water and feeder kits, do-it-yourself port feeder kits, water or nipple and water or cup kits. And you don't even need to drive to the stores. They're all available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Visit Amazon.com and check out the Roosty's range or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so let's move on to main topic. Yeah. 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 Main topic this week. We're going to talk about something that we're dealing with right now, and I'm sure you're dealing with right now, Mm -hmm. and your other chicken lady friends dealing with, and it is molting. Best practices for molting chickens. My run right now looks like a feather pillow exploded in all three parts. Mine, some days yes, some days no. So last year's pullets, two of them have molted. I'm expecting a a catastrophic molt from the other four. This is the weirdest thing for me. The little ones from last year aren't molting that badly, but they're molting. Mm -hmm. The big girls. Really? Yeah. Bubbles back is starting to do what Bubbles does. That's my buff Orpington and lose all of her feathers. And gosh, it's just not fun. So we want to give you some tips on how to manage molting. Molting is not a fun ordeal for the chicken and for us way worse for the chicken. Right. Quick overview. If you're new to chickens or you haven't gotten your chickens yet, chickens will shed a large percentage of their feathers every fall or late summer in order to grow healthy new feathers to keep them warm during the winter. Right. 
The feathers are made with keratin. And I talk about it all the time. It's what makes your fingernails. Mm-hmm. It what makes part of your hair, all that fun stuff. So the body has to reproduce this. And what this takes is a lot of protein. A lot of supplemental protein, yeah. Lots and lots of protein to make this. The other thing is, if you're new to molting, your chicken will not be laying eggs while they're molting. Right. They need to essentially corral all their resources into growing new feathers. It can be a long process. So for some chickens, they might have like a catastrophic molt. It's what we call it when they just dump tons of feathers. Yeah. And then they look like a pin cushion as their new ones come in. Yes. With some other hens, it might take them maybe three months losing bits at a time. I like it when they just lose them and then there's like two weeks, they look like a pincushion. I feel so bad for them for those two weeks though. Yeah. The other thing is handling should be minimal, very minimal during that time. Yeah. Their biggest need is more protein. Yeah. So let's go back and see how you can give them a little bit more protein in their diets. There's lots of different things that you can do. One thing is you can switch over their feed during that time right. to what's called feather fix or feed by Neutrina. Right. That feed pumps up the protein. Yes. It has a lot of different supplements in it that help, a lot of rich vitamins that mm-hmm. help. They give them what they need, what they're missing. Right. You can also feed a grower's feed or some all flock feed. You should always have oyster shell out if you still have hens laying. Yeah. But at this point, when your flock is going through this, you can switch the feed over to a grower's or some of the all flocks have a very high protein. Yeah. We always tell people if you're going to feed an all flock, you want to go with Neutrina Country Feeds all flock because it has the lowest protein of all of them. Check out the others during molting because a lot of them go really high. You can also use game bird feed. Yeah. And you can get that at TSC or most local feed stores. You can basically get all those foods at your local farm supply store. And a lot of them have protein as high as 20 to 22%. Yeah. When you look at your grower feed, that's 22%. The game bird is as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's for babies who, you know, they're going through mini molts as they grow. And Mm -hmm. that's one reason why the protein is so high in a grower feed. The other thing is with leaving oyster shell out. They're going to pick as they need it. The chickens won't take it if their body doesn't crave it. They're smart enough or they're instinctual enough to know they need a little extra calcium. And the thing is, they will maybe need a little more calcium as they're going through and making feathers and everything else. And that's why you always have the oyster shell. Also, if you don't have chickens molting at the same time, if you still have someone laying, you really need that oyster shell for them. Yeah, and it's very easy just to put out in a feeder they take it as they need Exactly. It. You can also supplement some high protein treats. Grublies are excellent. They yeah. have very high levels of protein. Sunflower seeds. Yeah, the those are really are good also. If you have a hen that's just doing poorly and not eating enough, tuna fish. Yeah, I like green peas to give my chickens while molting. Just buy a few of your frozen green peas in the frozen department. Do you steam them or microwave them? I just them? microwave them. Mm-hmm. And throw them out there. Peas are proven to be a vegetable that is very, very high in protein. Absolutely. It's a legume, yeah. Yeah. So they eat those up. They love them. It's a treat. You can also give them a little extra fat in their diet. The fat is a bit of a contentious subject in some places. Some people feel like you should never give your chickens added fat. Well, we disagree with this. We do because... Strongly. Honestly, when you're getting ready to beef up for the winter, during a molt chickens will naturally lose some weight. It's a very stressful process on their body. It's natural, but it is stressful. They're also uncomfortable. They're not going to be eating as much food as they normally do. So sometimes you do have to supplement a little. The other reason is just straight up science. Chickens need fat in their diet, just like us, to metabolize certain vitamins, A, D, E, and K. Yeah. Now, vitamin A in particular has a direct effect on skin health and in turn on the molting process. Poultry tend to get their vitamin A from greens. Right. So a little extra fat in their diet in the form of sunflower seeds or maybe a suet treat. Yeah. That will help them to metabolize that vitamin A. They need all of these things. So there's suet cakes out there that are wild bird peanut suet cakes. Yeah. And I don't even spend the extra money to go to get the chicken ones. They're basically the same Uh, Yeah. wild bird. And you can get them for like 99 cents. Yep. I get peanut because peanuts are very high in protein right. and they're held together by a fat. Yeah, the okay. suet is fat. It's not enough to make your chicken overweight. The thing is, when your chicken's going into winter, you want them to have some extra padding on them to keep them more warm. Absolutely. And so with the stress of molting and the vitamin needs, 
you don't want to be feeding them tons and tons, right. but that's the normal order of feeding. This is a small supplement you're going to give them. I don't know why there's this hysteria about feeding them extra fat. I don't know either. I honestly never I saw, really have seen an overweight chicken in my life, to be honest with I. you. That's a lot of bunk. I also see people saying, don't ever feed your chickens leftovers. Your grandmothers didn't do it. Well, my grandmother did it. Well, back in the day, there wasn't a commercial food right. made for your chickens, so that's what they ate. I don't like people taking their own body issues and superimposing them on their chickens. I saw someone recently fat shaming their chicken. In my whole life, never seen a chicken classified as an overweight big chicken. I haven't either. Some chickens are naturally larger than others due to their breed standards. But I've never in my life seen a chicken that I would say that's a big, large. Uh, an obese chicken, no. Never. Maya Claire tips the scales at eight pounds. And she's supposed to be every one of those eight pounds. Exactly. With molting and going in from fall to winter, you want them to be a good weight. The other reason why we say this is because if they do get sick or do lose a little weight during molt, right. you don't want them to be way too thin. Exactly. Now, I've seen thin chickens. Yes, I've seen thin the chickens. The other way around. My farm so, vet has said that for years. People always be worried about an animal being too heavy and he'll say a couple pounds extra is good because yeah. when a thin chicken or a thin any thin animal gets sick, they, they, have no go, reserve. they go downhill fast. So a suet cake that has a little bit of fat around it is not a bad thing. No, it's a good thing. It's a yeah. good thing. And actually, we have a really good do-it-yourself suet recipe. We do. On Grubblies. Yeah, Grubblies. We supplied Grubblies with yeah. it, and they yeah. had it on their blog. Right. And it, it was a winter treat. Yeah. And it's a suet donuts, and they love that. And we use it for molting because it's packed full of everything they need. Namely, protein and some fat. And here's yeah. the other thing. I've never seen a chicken overeat. They eat what they need. Yes. Most chickens, if you put them on the scale, are underweight for their breeds. I agree. Wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. A little bit of fat in their diet this time of the year, extra protein they is need not it. it's bad. It's good for their brain. It's good for their body. Like I said before, don't handle them too much. Those feathers will hurt yeah. coming in and they won't want to be held as much right now because basically, if you think about it, it's like a pin cushion. They're very ouchy. Yeah. It's what it is. Plus those pin feathers have a blood supply. Yeah. Until the feather grows out long enough and unfurls, at that point, the blood in the vein dries up. Yeah. But until then, you're dealing with a feather engorged with blood. Sometimes you'll see, especially with the feather-legged girls, you'll see a little blood on their foot yeah. because they've banged it on something uh -huh. and it made it bleed. That's one of the hardest parts of the molts, watching the feather-legged girls. Yes. I don't like to see that. Now, during this time, I've had this happen multiple times to myself with my chickens. You have to take them out and give them a little extra love during this time. Absolutely. Some chickens won't want to put themselves in the wrangling for the food bowl right. because they hurt. So if you see a chicken look like they're losing weight, that they're staying aside, that they're not eating. The best thing to do is to bring them out, feed them on their own. Right. I always give them Nutri-Drench. Yeah, CC yeah. CC a Nutri-Drench. Mm -hmm. And I add oats. Oh, yeah. Um, well, you kind of just took us into our next best practice, which is watch them closely. Yeah, of course. And then that's the biggest thing. Look for changes in behavior, especially whether they're eating or not. Yeah. So I've done this before. And in fact, I've always been on the phone with you while I'm bringing Often. them up. And I'm like, okay, Lucy's getting her oats. Mm -hmm. Lucy's a big one because she's a little leghorn. Yeah. And she doesn't want to interject herself in there. Also, my barred rocks, they're kind of the same way. They didn't want to put themselves in there. They tend to have a more catastrophic molt. Right now, Bernadette has no tail. Yeah. So She's rumpless. Yeah, she is. So I bring them up and give them extra treats, extra protein, extra food. I make mash. Yes. And I give them oats. Now, is there a careful way that you carry them? First thing I try to do is do an arm tuck so that the wings can't go anywhere uh -huh. and just keep it tucked as tightly as I can so mm -hmm. that there's no movement. Yeah. Where you're going to hurt them is if you're struggling with them. And you have your hands all over them. So if you tuck under your arm mm -hmm. and keep those wings in so yeah. they can't flap. Wings and feet. So you're carrying them like a football kind of. That's exactly how I carry them mm -hmm. and keep them as still as possible as you're walking. Yeah. That's how I do it. I try to do it so that there's least resistance because that's when they're going to hurt. Right. Exactly. So those changes in behavior, it's natural for them to hang back a little bit from the flock. But if you notice weight loss. Yes, you want to stay on top of that. Or if you see them not in the food bowl at all, yeah. this is where we say it's good to be out with your chickens sometimes during the day, during whatever time, the evening, the morning, midday, and watch their behavior. Right. Because you're going to see it. This is where they need a little extra push. And then what I've always seen when I do this with my chickens 
after two, three days, they're in there more. Yeah, they're feeling better. They're yeah. feeling better. They're feeling better. Yeah. And the suet cakes, there is a good holder. You can just even use the wild bird holders. Absolutely. And I hook them right on the fence in the run. Right on the fence wire, yeah. And then I put them around multiple places. And I love watching them because they go nuts over They do. Them. It's so cute. They it's love really fun. them. And the peanut one is the best because it's so high in protein. I agree. They love the peanuts. Our next best practice, minimize stress in your flock. No changes. Don't bring anybody new in. And just keep it as calm as possible. Molting chickens are already stressed, you know, physiologically because all the things going on with their body. Right. But also behaviorally because they know they're not feeling well and that leaves them vulnerable to shifts in the pecking order. They know they're not going to win a fight when they're that miserable. Yeah. So we got a little more science on this. There's a 2016 study published in the Poultry Science Journal. Okay. They note that elevated corticosterone levels produced by stress in poultry leads to decreased gastrointestinal functioning and elevated levels of heterophiles and lymphocytes. So what happens is the immune system becomes suppressed, but then it kicks in a higher immune response to help fix it. So the depressed immune system is trying to deal with increased immune response exactly. and inflammation. It's a crazy thing, mm-hmm. but it's the equivalent of a stress response in a person. Yeah. If you ever dealt with an anxiety attack, mm-hmm. it's a stress response. Right. I actually kind of equated it to fibromyalgia. Same thing. Yeah. Like it's your own body against itself. It's, yeah. And so that's what's happening when they have these elevated stress levels. Yeah. The gastrointestinal functioning is important there because you're wondering like, are they having absorption issues? Are they not getting the nutrients? If it's moving slower, you would hope that they were getting more out of the stuff. You would hope, but but maybe it's going more quickly. So this was also from the same study. I thought this was really fascinating. So, you know, you have the usual causes of stress in chickens, right? But something else that triggers production and release of corticosterone in chickens is low protein in their diets. Yeah. So essentially, molting itself is going to lower the protein. It's going to need more protein. So molting can definitely trigger protein deficiency, which means even more stress hormone is secreted into their system. The number one thing that we can't stress to you enough is that you need to up the protein in their diet. If there was one tip that I could say to everybody out there, Mm -hmm. I would say increase protein. If you add all these molting issues together and you look at the science, it's like you have the perfect storm for major stress. Yeah. It's really one of the most important phases that a chicken goes through that you need to have a lot of focus on them. Yeah, you need to be watching them. Honestly, the feather fixer, I've used that before. I love it. My only thing, Neutrina, if you're listening, make feather fixer in a crumble. For the people who feed crumble all year round. I'd like that for my bantams too. To go over to a pellet after you feed crumble all year, it's very difficult. It is. Because your chickens are used to eating one way. Absolutely. And if you change the food for two months, Mm -hmm. it's very difficult. So what I do is I add it in my crumble Uh and mix it. Yeah, that works. So I feel like they can pick and choose, Mm -hmm. but I definitely change up and add this feather fixer in and I've noticed major differences when I do it. Yeah, I've been using one of the higher protein all flocks that has about the same protein level, but yeah. Protein snacks, the grublies, the grubs, those are amazing. Up your protein as soon as you start to see a mold. And our last best practice for molting chickens is watch the weather. Yeah, because they're not going to have any feathers to protect them. Right. So if it's really sunny out, they could get a sunburn. Absolutely, they can get sunburned. If it's really rainy, they have no feathers there. They're going to get wet. Right. If we're starting to get frost, if you have wind, all of these things, make sure they have plenty of shelter. Make sure there are no drafts in their coop at night because they really, really, really need protection from drafts at night. I've actually done the same thing. I've brought chickens in on really cold December days that are going through a mold. Yes. Brought them in to, I call the chicken ICU, my garage let them spend the day out there and then put them back out because it was too cold. Right. So these are things that you can help with along the way Mm -hmm. and make their molt a little easier on them. Right. So if you have any other questions or concerns, feel free to DM us on Instagram or Facebook or send us an email and we will get back to you with those answers as soon as we can. Okay. So let's move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now today... Since it's the first day of school here, Mm -hmm. and we'd like to send our kids to school with something that's going to hold them all the way to lunchtime, we figured we would do a recipe, and it's called the Super Easy Morning Egg Bake. It is so good. (laughs) It's super easy. It is. It's right in the title. (laughs) Right in the title. So this is like scrambled eggs, but a bigger portion and quicker and easier. Yeah. Essentially. 
you're going to use like a nine by nine pan. I just use like a nine by nine brownie pan. Yeah. Glass Pyrex pan. Preheat your oven about 350. This was counterintuitive and I was kind of nervous about it at first because I thought it would stick, but it worked perfectly. So use a tablespoon of butter. I use non-dairy butter. You can use more if you want to, but a tablespoon worked just fine. Sometimes too much butter makes it too oily. Yeah. So you yeah. don't, you got to really watch. So I did the one tablespoon. I cut it into small pieces and kind of just sprinkled them around. Yeah. And then you use about a half of a cup of grated cheese. You can use cheddar. I have to use dairy free. Yeah. You can also use more than half a cup. If you want a little different taste, you can do pepper jack. You can do a different yeah, cheese. Yeah, any whatever, kind of cheese. Any kind you want. You're going to take six fresh eggs. You're going to beat them in a bowl. You're going to set them aside for right now. If you grow your own herbs, you can use greens for this too, but I used herbs out of my garden. I used chives and mm-hmm. I used chervil, which is like a parsley, right? and chop them up finely. You're going to mix them in with half of a cup of cream or dairy-free half and half. You can go with something lower fat if you yeah. want to, but it's only half a cup and it makes it really creamy. I think for kids, the regular cream or the half and half is good it's because fine. I think they need it. They need some fat for their brain too. They do. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have your chopped herbs. You're going to mix them in with that cream or half and half. You're going to use about half of a teaspoon of salt, about a quarter of a teaspoon of pepper. Mix those together. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to pour that half and half mixture all over the bottom of the pan. Yeah. Then you're going to carefully pour the eggs over top. Okay. And you're going to bake it for 35 minutes. It's going to puff up. Right. And so I found that with the dairy-free cream, it didn't cook all the way in certain spots. Okay. So I took it out of 35 minutes. It was pretty well cooked and puffed, but it had those spots where it hadn't cooked all the way. I popped it under the broiler for two minutes and it was perfect. Yeah. You may not have to do that with the regular dairy. When I bake eggs like that, I like my top to be like kind of uniformly brown on yeah. the top. And the broiler took care of that. Yeah, I'm sure. And the cream might help it along, do it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So it's good, easy. It's a half an hour. You can get up. There's not a lot of prep to it. Yeah. You can just mix the things that you need, put it in the oven, and then serve it with a piece of toast for the kids in the morning. You can chop the herbs ahead of time, or you can just use dried herbs. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. It works really well. We like these recipes that you can make your own because everybody has a little different taste palette. So whatever herbs you like, whatever herbs you grow... You can change up the taste. Right. You can make it Southwest. You can throw some black beans and corn in it. Absolutely. You can even cook this the night before. Yeah. And give it a little warm up the next morning. Exactly. Nothing better than a little bit of eggs Mm -hmm. for high protein before the school, before you go to work, Mm -hmm. and it's quick and easy. What I really liked about this, besides the fact that it tasted ridiculously good, is that you can even cut a square of it and make a sandwich out of it if you want it a little more hearty. Or you put a little hot sauce or salsa on top. I did do the salsa. Yeah. It was really I good. love salsa and eggs. <laughs> it's no big secret. I've said it a million times. It's delicious. It's delicious. So try it. Let us know what you think. So let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. This week's retail therapy, we're looking at automatic chicken coop door openers. That was a long thing to say. It's a mouthful. We tried out the Mana Pro. Right. Mana Pro Harris Farms sent us one of their doors to try. Yes. So we put it on one of my big coops. Yes. And your girls are liking it. They do like it. They like it because it lets them pop out in the morning without me. Exactly. So what we thought we would do is sit here and talk for a little while and give you some feedback on all the auto door openers. Right. Just the concept of the auto door itself. What you might like about an auto door is that you can set it to open and let your chickens out in the morning. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I will tell you that we still close everyone up at night. Even if I had an auto door in every one of my coops, I want to do a head count at night. This is kind of where both you and I stand. Uh We want to see everybody. I feel like the auto doors work really well for the morning, and that way they can come out earlier than you. If you want your coffee and you want them to be out and enjoying it and not feel bad, it's great. But I feel like after that, after you finish your coffee, you still have to go out and do a health check on everybody, Mm -hmm. make sure everybody's crop feels good, make sure everybody feels good. I personally would not want to use one at night. No. And actually, we had an issue last night, in fact, when we had that heavy rainstorm. We were going out to close up and everyone had already gone in, even though it was quite early because it was so dark and rainy. Yeah. And Pete went into the Brahma yard and he did a head count and Emma, the coachin, was missing. Yeah. And he found her huddled down on the side of the run outside of the auto door that had already closed because it was set on the light timer. Yeah. So you have to be very careful. And that's where the problem comes in. For whatever reason, if somebody doesn't make it in, for chickens, it is a matter of life or death if they don't make it in. 
we're checking. Yes. So it's a good thing you guys did. Yeah, we always tuck everything in at night. If I'm yeah. not there, Pete does it. Exactly. Always do a head count before we close that door. The one good thing, let's talk about the Mana Pro. Mm-hmm. You actually can do a time setting on that door. <laughs> yes. And if I were using this regularly, I would definitely have it set to time because the light sensor, there was also an overcast morning. Yeah. And when I went out to let everyone out, they were still in because the light sensor hadn't worked. Yeah. I feel like the time sensor would work the best. Right. But say there's a squabble getting into the coop because you're integrating new chicks. Uh huh. That's where somebody could get left outside. The time sensor, you could give yourself some extra time to make sure everybody gets in, but still go out and check them. Yeah. Or the other thing that you brought up before was to put a camera in so that from the inside of the house, you you can can count count. heads. Yeah. And that also is a good thing to do. Yes. In fact, we have the Nestera coop cam. I have not put mine in. Yeah. But that would be a pretty good way to use it. I wanted to note one more thing about the Harris Farms door that I really liked. Okay. I don't know if this is a case for all doors or not, but in the case of the Harris Farm, the Mana Pro, I installed it on the inside. Right. And I like that for extra predator protection. Right. So theoretically, let's say I had them on all of my coops and they were closing at night. We could come behind it and still close and lock the pop door. Yes. So just an extra layer in there. I and really I like would, that. I would because I'm always a nervous Nelly yeah. when it comes to at night and protection. Right. I like that installing it on the inside. Mm-hmm. The extra door that is already there, you can use as more predator proof. Yep. Close the regular way. That was fantastic. I really like that about it. The Mana Pro, that was really cool. Yes. Besides Mana Pro, there are a few others on the market mm-hmm. that you can look at. Chicken Guard is a big maker yeah. of the automatic door opener. Right. They have two different models. They have an extreme and a standard. And my understanding is that Chicken Guard has a nice locking mechanism on their door. That's what we've heard from yeah. our friend Libby. And the other thing with Chicken Guard is when you're purchasing that door, make sure that you purchase the combo. So you need door and opener. Because they do sell just the opener okay. without the door. Uh-huh. So make sure when you're looking them up that you get the combo deal or you're going to get it delivered and you're just going to say, what am I supposed to do with it? I this? guess the only way that will work is if you have a door... That would already work with the opener mechanism. Which would be strange to me because they work together somehow. Yeah. I think that requires a lot of reading on your part just to see exactly how it works. So just make sure, it's just a little tip Uh as we were looking things up, to make sure that you're buying a combination and not just purchasing the mechanism that controls it and think that you have everything. Exactly. Brincy also makes an opener. Yes. That's on the market. And also, Omelette makes one. Mm -hmm. There were some off-brands. Yeah. Which might be fine. You just want to do your reading. What I like about the Omelette is that it works on the Omelette because the Omelette doors swing. Okay. You have lots of Omelettes. I do. The thing I liked about the Omelette is it's side by side. Well, that's exactly right. Yeah. The the way the Omelette coupe doors are configured. Yeah. Yeah. That was really nice. The other thing I like about a lot of these openers is their battery power. Yes. Because we don't have electricity. We have to run very long, heavy duty extension cords Mm -hmm. in the winter and the summer back to our coops. Right. To the back of our property. And I'm sure a lot of people have the same deal where they don't have electricity. Mm -hmm. So the fact that these work on AA batteries. That's pretty awesome. Is pretty awesome. We love it for in the morning. You might not be the nervous Nellies that we are. You might be fine with having them put in, although we would strongly suggest that you go count heads later and make sure everyone went in. But it could be a lifesaver if you have a long commute, something like that. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of places where these work really well. As we know, not everyone is as fortunate as we are and gets to work from home. Right. What's the rough price point for most of these? Around, let's say, a little over $100 to a little over $200. Okay. So it's in that price category. What you're going to do is you're going to look through each one and see which features fit your lifestyle, yeah. your coupe the best. Mm-hmm. The Mana Pro was really nice. I mm-hmm. liked the fact that you could set for light or timer. Yeah, that is convenient. And the door works really well. You've yeah. said it goes up mm-hmm. and down very well. As long as you install, it needs to be perfectly level. Yeah. And the opener needs to be above it perfectly level. It wasn't hard to install. I mean, it was literally a screwdriver. Yeah. I did it myself in 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Unless you have a chicken with a serious issue, plenty of time for them to get in and out as it's raising and lowering. Yeah. And then the other thing was the chicken guard had the extra locking feature. Yes, which I do like as well. 
honestly, all these brands probably have something for someone. Yes. Like you said, you want to go through, read, and figure out which one has the features you need. Yeah. I mean, even if you're like us, I would just use it in the morning, let them out, Mm -hmm. and then at night, go talk them in. Right. Or if you know that you're going to be away, put a camera in so you can check heads and know if there's somebody that you can call and say, I'm only seeing nine instead of 10. Swarm, swarm, go see what's (laughs) happening. (laughs) Go see what's happening. Because the first thing that you want to be sure of is the safety of your flock. Absolutely. We're very lucky to both be working from home. Right. If you're in a long commute and it's better safe, you know, to have them and you can set the timer. Right. I mean, if you're a professional baker and you need to be at work at 4 a.m., one of these would be a lifesaver. Let your flock out at six or seven. I think in the morning, it's the way to go. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, especially like you said, if you have to be at work at 4 a.m. to mm-hmm. bake or to do whatever, how are you going to let your chickens out at 4 a.m.? You right. can't let them out at 4 a.m. Right. So these are the ones that we've looked at. Check them out. Yeah. Let us know what you think. Uh-huh. Okay. So let's tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week. Next week, we are taking a deep dive into one of the most important breeds of all time. The Orpington. The Orpington. Mm-hmm. Yay. We are talking about sauerkraut. We're answering a bunch of listener questions. There's been so much sauerkraut happening it's a this do month. do not miss. Mm-hmm. Our recipe is my lemon anise tea cake. It's delicious. Yummy. And our retail therapy, we're talking about Pyrex. My fave. But Pyrex with chickens on it. Yay! Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. Don't forget, we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.